All right, let's get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 14th session of Space on the Hill, a series of talks designed uh, to bring the excitement and information about current research on us astronomical topics to the Hill. This series is co-sponsored by the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, one of the nine research centers um, of the Smithsonian Institution and the American Astronomical Society. My name is Kelly Corrick. I'm a PhD astrophysicist who studies our star, the sun, at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Smithsonian was founded for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. If you've ever visited one of our museums, you know that's about the diffusion part. Today, we're gonna to focus on the increase part, our research. So our co-sponsor is the American Astronomical Society or the AAS. Uh, is a major organization of professional astronomers in North America. Their mission is to enhance and share humanity's scientific understanding of the universe. Astronomy impacts our lives more ways than people realize, and we hope that this series serves as a useful resource for informed policy decisions. So welcome to the, uh, to the Space on Hill on the topic of asteroid mining. Today's NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission will collect a sample from uh, the asteroid venue. For a little background, asteroids are smaller than a planet, rocky objects that orbit the sun. They range in size from about a meter to hundreds of kilometers. Uh, Bennu is around 500 meters across. So these near earth objects or NEOs, or a class of which Bennu uh, belongs to are asteroids or comets that are near the earth. And if they are too close to the earth, um, they can become potentially hazardous objects or PHOs. Um, now it's not all doom and gloom here like the dinosaurs. Um, as we will see here, there is much to learn scientifically um, from these messengers from the outer solar system. In addition, um, mining of the minerals and waters contained in these asteroids could be vital for the next generation of space exploration. We really appreci appreciate you for joining uh, our first Zoom session of Space on the Hill. We're delighted you could join us and are happy to share with you some information on asteroid uh, sampling and mining, which is happening today. So uh, Dr. Vicki Hamilton will introduce us to osiris Specs mission and an overview. Uh, Dr. Erica Howen will uh, dive into the geology of these near-Earth visitors. Dr. Brandon Allen will talk about a student experiment that developed new technologies to get a brand new view of this asteroid. And Dr. Tim McCoy will talk about the future of asteroid mining and exploration. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our four speakers. Uh, Dr. Vicki Hamilton is a staff scientist at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Her research focuses on using infrared spectroscopy to study minerals, rocks, meteorites, and planetary surfaces as records of geological history in the solar system. Dr. Erica Jowen is a postdoctoral re post research geologist in the Department of Mineral Sciences at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. She studies how surface evolves on planets and asteroids. Brandon Allen is an astronomer at Harvard University engaged in the development of new X-ray detectors and technologies for use in astronomy and for the exploration of our solar system. Tim McCoy is curator in charge of the US National Meteorite Coll Collection and chair of the Department of Mineral Sciences at the Smithsonian Institute's Institutions National Museum of Natural History. His research focuses on the formation and differentiation of asteroids in the early history of the solar system. He's also a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, working as, a teach, working as a teacher and learner about the earth and the sky from a tribal perspective. So please use the chat uh, function down at the bottom, the little uh, bubble um, for questions as you have them and we'll address those at the end. Um, so with that, Vicki, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here on what promises to be one of the most exciting days of the year for the OSIRIS-REx mission. Um, what I'm going to do is start out today by talking a little bit about asteroid Bennu as it has been seen so far by the OSIRIS-REx mission. Before I launch into that, I do want to make a point here, which is that the OSIRIS-REx mission is a very institutionally and geographically diverse group of people. We represent universities, NASA, industry, not-for-profit research companies like my own, uh, museums, and we have international collaborations as well. And so there's a sampling of logos here that, that really only scratch the surface of who we are and where we are and what we do. So why OSIRIS-REx? Why asteroids? Um, primitive asteroids like Bennu are really time capsules. They really haven't changed much 
in the last four and a half billion years since they were formed. That's a record that we no longer have here on the earth because our earth is so geologically active. So what we want to do is go and retrieve a sample that is as pristine as possible of early solar system material. This kind of material like asteroid Bennu and its, its brethren um, preserves early solar system water and early solar system organics. And these are things that really play a big role in how all of us got to be here today. So we want to understand uh, details of the chemistry and formation of these objects back in, in early solar system time. While we're at the asteroid, of course, we want to take advantage and map its geology, its surface composition, and learn as much about it as we can. And then you've also heard already that asteroids can be potentially hazardous. This is something that has been in the news quite a lot. And we have the ability while we're there to measure properties of the asteroid that can lead to its orbit changing over time, making it either potentially more hazardous or actually less hazardous. And then the other thing we wanna do is compare the observations we make of asteroid Bennu to ground-based observations that we've made of both Bennu as well as many other asteroids. Obviously we can't fly missions like OSIRIS-REx to all of the places we would like to go. So we rely really heavily on our ground-based telescopic infrastructure. A lot of that is supported, for example, by NSF. Uh, to allow us to look at many, many more objects than we can possibly send missions to. And so we want to make sure that when we have the opportunity to go to an object and look at it up close, we relate that back to the measurements we would make from Earth and, and use that to help us ground truth what we're doing. So here is asteroid Bennu on the left. It's, a, it's what we call a shape model. Um, so it's not an actual image of the asteroid, but it's about a half a, a kilometer across. It's, it's a rather smallish asteroid. And then you have a couple of uh, architectural marvels there for, for scale. And a lot of people wonder how we chose asteroid Bennu as our target. In 2010, when we were uh, proposing this mission, there were about a half a million known asteroids at that point in time. Now, of those, there were more, there were more like about 7,000 that were actually in Earth crossing orbits. And so that's what we knew we wanted to target because of this issue of uh, potential hazards. So that narrowed things down considerably, but that's still a big number. What we also needed to do, we knew, was if we were going to do a sample return, we needed to pick a target that we could get to and get back to Earth from. Usually with planetary missions, we send a spacecraft out to the moon or Mars or a comet, and we don't expect it to come back to Earth. But in this case, we needed to be able to return our sample. So we needed to have an asteroid that had an orbit that would make it feasible for us to easily return the spacecraft to Earth. So that got us down to just under 200 asteroids. Then we also needed an asteroid that was just the right size for us to be able to do operations around it with a spacecraft. Having a five kilometer, I'm sorry, a five meter asteroid wouldn't really do very much for us. It would be very hard to operate around and work around. So we wanted something that was bigger than 200 meters in size. Now we're down to 26 potential candidates. And then, as I mentioned, this time capsule aspect of preserving early water and early organics led us to want to choose an asteroid that we had really strong reason to believe would be carbon bearing or even carbon rich. And so that got us down to five. And then of those five, we selected Bennu. So what have we learned from Bennu now that we've been there for almost two years? We think of most asteroids as being old dead rocks that not, are not particularly active, but Bennu proved us wrong almost right away. This is one of my favorite images of the mission. Um, you see Bennu in the lower left corner and then off to the right hand side of the image, a bunch of white spots that look like a star field in the background. It turns out those aren't stars. Those are actually particles being ejected off the surface of Bennu. And so here's a, a little uh, oval to help identify what I'm talking about here. This was completely unexpected. And at first it was a, a source of concern because we wanted to make sure that these particles being ejected weren't gonna damage the spacecraft in some way. 
They're typically about one to 10 centimeters in size. We ascertain that they really don't pose much of a hazard to spacecraft operations. So we really started focusing on the science of what might be causing them. It could be thermal cycling, hot, cold cycles that lead to fracturing and things popping off the surface. There are water in minerals on the rocks on Bennu, and so it could be that that water is being released. Or it could be that Bennu itself is getting hit by meteors, and that is causing the ejection of small particles. Now, what was also interesting about this was that we've seen this behavior on larger asteroids but we've never seen it on asteroids this small. So it lets us know that these processes, whatever they are, occur at all kinds of asteroid scales. And what's also neat is that we've got an unexpected front row seat to a process that really does modify asteroids over time and potentially ultimately even destroy them. We've also discovered that Bennu is an old and dynamic object. It's not the original asteroid. It is a, a daughter asteroid, so to speak, but it's still old with its own history. The colored image map at the top right here is the surface of Bennu. And one of the things you can see is that across the surface, particularly in the equatorial regions, you can see these circular or quasi-circular uh, features, and these are impact craters. And their size relative to Bennu indicates that they're probably quite old. The boxes denote the pictures that are below, and these show that there are actually also very small craters on Bennu. So Bennu is still getting hit by other objects today. The box in hot pink is our tag site where we will be collecting a sample today. Uh, it is called Nightingale, and that smooth little crater right in the middle of the big red box is where we're, we're aiming for today. Now, I said we thought Bennu and other asteroids like it were old dead rocks, but that these particles were being ejected. We also see other evidence of dynamic processes, and that's shown over here on the left. The arrow shows small rocks that have somehow migrated over a much bigger, more massive rock. And so we, we didn't expect to see necessarily this kind of behavior on an asteroid like this. And so this is something that uh, Erica, our next speaker, has uh, worked on. And then Erica will also talk a little bit about how we actually selected the Nightingale site for sampling. One of the other things that we wanted to accomplish, as I mentioned, was to look at an organic rich object, a carbon rich object. We also are interested in early water. And it turns out that we've been able to ascertain with OSIRIS-REx that Bennu is made up primarily of minerals that form in the presence of water. And some of those minerals even still contain water today locked up in their structures. So the sample that we return is going to allow us to study these minerals in detail and also study the water that's locked up inside them. We also see evidence in our data for prebiotic organic compounds. So these are, this is definitely not life, but it is the chemistry that precedes life. And so the graphic on the right sort of shows you the, the sequence from simple molecules to more complicated molecules. And that's what we're sampling here with Bennu. And ultimately those molecules evolve into organized structures that lead to all of us sitting here today. Uh, Tim will be talking a little bit more about the water and its relevance and importance to us. So today is our TAG event. So TAG stands for touch and go. We don't actually land on the surface of Bennu. The robot arm with its touch and go sample head contacts the surface as you see in the animation on the left. And then gas, uh, neutral gas is injected to the surface. It causes the surface to become disrupted. And then the particles flow into our sample collection chamber. That sampling head is shown in two pictures on the right. Uh, those are in-flight photos of the TAGSAM. And when we see that object again, we'll be photographing again later today after the uh, touch and go maneuver. It should look a whole lot dirtier than it does right there. So stay tuned. There's all kinds of live events going on today talking about the TAG event and the TAG progress. 
And with that, I will thank you for your time and encourage you to keep following the progress of OSIRIS-REx going forward. Thank you, Vicki. And next up we have uh, Erica. All right. Thanks for that great introduction, Vicki. Uh, so today I'm going to speak, uh, as Vicki mentioned, a little bit more about Bennu's geology and how we've been preparing for the sample collection that's happening later today. So to pick up right where Vicki left off, uh, we are sampling today, our, our tag event is happening later this evening. Uh, our plan is to collect around 60 grams of material in the tag SAM instrument. And for reference, 60 grams of material is roughly the equivalent of 30 sugar packets worth of material. So it's really not a huge amount of uh, rocks that we're planning on bringing back to earth, uh, but we'll be able to do a huge amount of science with just, just those sugar packets. So the, the tag sand instrument that's shown in this schematic in the lower right-hand portion of the slide um, it was designed to ingest pretty small particles. So material up to around two centimeters in diameter. Um, and this uh, sampling mechanism is really ideally suited to sampling fine grain materials that uh, the, the pre-launch data of Bennu suggested that Bennu was dominated by very fine grain small particles across its surface. Uh, so before the spacecraft was launched, there were not any resolved images of the surface of the asteroid like we saw in the last presentation. Um, and so the, the spacecraft engineers and designers had to rely on Earth-based telescopic observations of Bennu. And all of those data suggested that the asteroid, um, the surface of the asteroid was dominated by around centimeter sized particles. So that's the reason that the tag SAM instrument was designed to sample um, these, these fine grain particles. We believe that there were what we refer to as sandy beaches all over the surface of Bennu. So then uh, when the spacecraft actually arrived at the asteroid and we started receiving the first resolved images of the surface, we found out that Bennu is actually much rougher than we anticipated. There are boulders everywhere on the surface. The largest boulder on the asteroid is about as large as a football field, one, one single boulder, uh, which is massive. And uh, there are boulders sticking out of the ground, as you can see on the left image, there are boulders of all shapes and sizes and colors, as you can see in the image on the right. Um, and basically, the, there are no sandy beaches anywhere on the surface of Bennu, uh, which posed a real problem for identifying sample sites, which I'll talk about um, in a few slides. Um, and so while the abundance of boulders on Bennu is a real problem for the sampling mechanism, uh, these boulders are actually really great for science. Because as Vicky alluded to, Bennu is not a first generation asteroid. It's called uh, what we refer to as a rubble pile asteroid, which means that there was a parent body asteroid that was catastrophically disrupted by a huge impact. Um, and that impact shattered the, the parent body asteroid. And those shattered fragments reaccumulated and formed this basically very loosely held together ball of or pile of rubble. Um, and so the boulders that we see on the surface of Bennu are really those intact fragments of the parent body. So by studying the characteristics of the boulders, we can better understand the asteroid that existed before Bennu existed. And from our uh, initial analyses of the boulders on Bennu, there's actually quite a lot of diversity and heterogeneity in the boulders that we see on Bennu. Uh, so this image on the left-hand side shows this very bright boulder that has a surface texture that is very smooth, uh, very angular with these big fractures going through the boulder. Um, the data suggests that these bright boulders are very dense and have been quite altered by water or some sort of fluid thro flowing through the parent body asteroid. Uh, in comparison, these darker boulders that are shown on the right-hand side of the image appear to be much rougher, um, more rounded. They have some layers going through the boulders sometimes. Uh, and other data suggests that these boulders in comparison to the bright boulders are much more porous. So if you think of a sponge, uh, the sponge is solid, but it has these big holes going through it. So it's very porous. And so these rocks, they're not soft and squishy like a sponge, but they do have these very big holes potentially in the, the structure of the rock itself. 
Um, and so these dark boulders are very porous. Um, they're potentially weaker than the brighter boulders, and they may have been slightly less altered by water on the parent body. So we're really getting a, a really great understanding about Bennu, um, its composition, and potentially its parent body. And all of these observations are going to be really interesting and really useful when we get the sample back to Earth and we can compare the sample in the laboratory to all the data that we've been collecting from orbit. Um, but as I mentioned before, the sample site can't really have any of these huge boulders in the site because we can't, we can't ingest those large particles in the TAGSAM instrument. So we really had to find a sample site that was free of any large boulders or even large particles. Uh, and so what happened was um, the engineers and the navigation team um, went back and said, okay, we realized that there are no large, very smooth sites on the surface of the asteroid. The original region of interest, the original sample site footprint had to be 50 meters wide, which is this orange circle shown in this image. And the navigation team said, okay, instead of 50 meters, can you find a smooth sampleable region that's eight meters in diameter? And for scale, um, eight meters is uh, two or three conventional parking spaces wide. So in comparison, it's much, much smaller than the original 50 meters. Um, and this small sample site size actually allowed us to identify many more regions on the surface that were viable. So that was the first really big change that allowed us to find um, some really great sample sites on the surface, this much smaller size. The navigation team also implemented two quite novel um, engineering maneuvers that the spacecraft would do. The first one was called natural feature tracking and the second is called bullseye tag. So natural feature tracking, um, the, the plan for this is basically that we as the humans on the science team would manually count every single hazard in the sample site. And then we would upload that catalog of hazards onto the spacecraft. And then as the spacecraft um, travels towards the surface to perform the sample maneuver, it will image the surface and will compare all of the hazards on the surface to our hazard database. And the spacecraft will basically steer itself between all of those hazards. And then as it's steering itself autonomously between these hazards, the bullseye tag maneuver will take over. And the spacecraft will basically plan its trajectory down to the surface. And if it calculates that it will avoid all of the hazards in the site, it will go all the way to the surface and tag and collect the sample. But if the trajectory is such that the spacecraft would tag on top of a hazard, such as a large boulder, the spacecraft will execute what's called a wave off maneuver and will basically abort that trajectory and leave the asteroid or leave that descent and will come back and try again so that it doesn't accidentally you know, hit a very large boulder and potentially damage the spacecraft. So these, these are totally new. These natural feature tracking and bullseye tag were not part of the sampling plan before we arrived at Bennu, but this was all implemented so that we would have our best possible chance of collecting a sample from the asteroid. And with these plans and the smaller sample site size of eight meters, we were actually able to identify over a hundred potential sample sites on the surface. That was a huge diversity of locations and geologic settings. Um, and of those 100, over 100 sites, we were able to narrow that down to the best four on the surface of the asteroid. And for the natural feature tracking, um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we had to count every single rock in every single one of these final sample sites. Um, and that was such a huge amount of work that we actually implemented a crowdsourcing effort through uh, this uh, site called CosmoQuest, uh, in which uh, volunteer citizen scientists from all across the country, all across the world, helped us to map each individual boulder. Um, and just from the Cosmo Quest counting alone, there were over 13 million rocks counted by over 3,600 mappers in these sample sites. And so we, we took all of those data together, we analyzed what would be the safest, smoothest, most scientifically interesting location on the surface of the asteroid. And hands down, the best spot is our, our primary sample site called Nightingale, which is shown in this image in the lower right. Um, and this Nightingale site is located in the upper left-hand portion of the global map, shown on the left, where there's a little Nightingale symbol. Our backup site we've nicknamed Osprey, which is a little bit further south, closer to the equator. Um, but Nightingale 
is, is a really amazing site. It appears to be a very young impact crater. Our data suggests that this crater contains uh, potentially quite abundant carbon bearing materials, which is critically important for the return sample, as Vicky mentioned. Uh, and this is, this is our site where we will be touching the surface of this site later today at around uh, 5 or 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and so this GIF in the lower left hand side of the slide is a video of our last rehearsal maneuver. You can see the tag arm is extended and it's flying over the sample site, which is this nice smooth patch on the surface of the asteroid. So we're really looking forward to the tag event happening later today. And even more than that, we're looking forward to getting the return sample back in 2023. So thanks very much. And uh, next up is Brandon, who's going to be talking about some of the specific instruments uh, on board the spacecraft. Thanks. Okay. Hi. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, actually more specifically Rexus, but uh, just before I jump into that, I'd like to point out, of course, that Osiris Rex has a number of different instruments. So this is the uh, spacecraft deck or the, the main instrument deck um, with the sample return capsule. So really the, the star of the show uh, coming up where we'll, where we'll store the sample for crews back and return to Earth. Uh, the tag sam, which uh, you've seen a number of animations in the previous talks on, uh, this is, um, you know, you don't see the, the whole bar here. It's basically stowed in the back during launch and then extended when we go to, uh, to collect our sample. Um, but that's, that's where it's stowed behind the sample return capsule. And then there are a number of different telescopes and instruments on board, the laser altimeter um, and uh, the visible infrared spectrometer, OTES, there's also a thermal emission spectrometer and so on. And all of these uh, allow us in different ways to characterize uh, the surface of the asteroid. And today I'm gonna to talk primarily about REXUS, which is the, um, a student collaboration between Harvard and MIT and the University of Arizona and the OSIRIS-REx collaboration to try and bring education and science uh, together. So it's a, it was a unique opportunity to try and push some new technologies while at the same time educating the next generation of, of scientists. Um, so REXUS is sitting here and then it actually consists of two parts. Um, so the primary spectrometer, which is a CCD camera, uh, but a CCD that's sensitive to X-rays looking out through a coded aperture mask. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that enables us to try and uh, to image essentially uh, elements on the surface of, uh, of the asteroid. And then uh, looking off toward the sun so that we understand the inputs uh, from the sun. So our, our observations with REXUS are actually very, very dependent on input solar X-rays to excite X-rays on the surface of the asteroid, which I'll, I'll describe in more detail in a minute here. Uh, I always get ahead of myself with these things. Um, so generally REXUS is unique in the sense that we see the entire asteroid while we're in orbit. So from a one kilometer orbit, which is roughly what's uh, shown here, we're looking out and seeing the entire disk of the, uh, of the object. Uh, the way the REXUS works is, is the X-rays come in from the sun, they interact with the surface, and then some of those X-rays come back to the spacecraft. Um, and particularly what we're interested in are fluorescence X-rays. Um, and then these uh, are actually a, uh, are emitted with a unique energy uh, depending upon the element, which gives you uh, essentially a signature or a fingerprint for what sort of asteroid uh, we're looking at. Um, so just a, a very quick overview of what's happening on the surfaces. The sun comes in, interacts with a bunch of these uh, elements. So I've you know, put in different colors, different bubbles to represent different uh, things like magnesium, aluminum, silicon, um, things that'll allow us to figure out what the what the asteroid's made of. And what happens is, is you know, we at the atomic level uh, receive one of these solar X-rays. It goes in, interacts with one of the atoms, and uh, oftentimes uh, knocks out an inner shell electron. So this creates a vacancy, which after a bit of a relaxation period, um, allows an electron from an outer shell to drop in. So in order to do that, that electron basically has to emit a, a photon. And depending upon what element you're looking at, 
uh, the energy of that photon is, is completely unique. Um, so what you end up with at the end of the day is uh, something like this. So if you take all of the, the light, all of the photons, sorry, I love using the word photons, but uh, if you take all of the X-ray light and you stack up all of those, uh, those energies, you end up with something that looks like this. So oxygen sits here at one particular energy, iron, magnesium, silicon, and this really tells you, or this really is the signature that we're looking for in order to identify the, uh, the different, um, the, the potential family or the potential type of asteroid that Bennu comes from. Um, so this is an example. Each one of these dots in this plot would represent a, a different type of asteroid. And for our measurement, we, of course, end up, or we expect to end up in, in this region. So you use the, the iron to silicon ratio to the magnesium to silicon ratio, and you can discern what type of asteroid you're looking at. Um, now, we're not just a spectrometer. We don't just measure energies and pile this up over the entire asteroid. We also look at um, the, uh, the images. We're also an imager, which means that we're able to try and localize these area, uh, different areas on the, on the surface with um, enhancements in elemental abundance. And one of the things, uh, but we don't do this you know, in, in the sense of a normal camera. So x-rays don't focus very easily. So what we do is, is we basically have a, a, a pattern that we stick above that detector plane. So we have a, a, a mask which blocks some of the light and then lets some of the, the light through. And if you have a source that's sitting up here you know, off axis or you know, if you're looking off to the side, that shadow will move on the detector plane. So reconstructing the shadow that's caused by a strong X-ray source allows us to figure out where that X-ray source is, is coming from. So this is way, the way that you can build a very wide X-ray, uh, I'm sorry, a very wide field X-ray imager. Um, and the way that this works in practice is, is you, have, um, you have this sort of hole pattern. This casts a shadow on your detector plane, and then you can cross correlate that, and then you end up with a, uh, a point source in this, in this uh, example. Um, if you have many, many different sources, then you end up with many, many different points and so on. Um, and the way that we, uh, we are intending to use this is essentially to try and take one of those elements. So, you know, for iron, for instance, if, you know, you can imagine somebody dropping a wrench, although we're not that sensitive, but you can imagine somebody dropping a wrench on the surface of the asteroid, it would be a big iron clump. So if we were to see a big iron clump on the surface, uh, the idea was to essentially take and uh, really, really go after that fine scale and see whether or not we could actually find those clumps of iron, find those clumps of magnesium and, and, and really go after, um, after non-heterogeneity in the, in the asteroid itself. So it's a, it's a very interesting prospecting tool if you want to think of it that way, um, not just an identification tool. Um, and the other thing that this has allowed us to do, uh, so this, this technology of coded aperture instrument, uh, or instrumentation has been used in astronomy before, mainly to look for uh, outbursts from, from variable or transient X-ray objects, which often are black holes and neutron stores that are, that are eating their neighbor. But uh, we managed to, for the very first time, find one of these low max, uh, sorry, these low mass X-ray binary transients from interplanetary space. And also it's a first from orbit around an asteroid, though there aren't that many uh, instances of taking these sorts of images from orbits around asteroids anyway. Um, but, uh, but there it is. So we found a uh, essentially a black hole binary detection. Uh, we think it's a black hole binary. Um, so, which is essentially, as I was saying, just a, a black hole eating its companion. So a star gets too close to a black hole or a star gets too close to a neutron star. And then you suck material off of that. That material falls in and it superheats. And that superheating uh, creates a, uh, a very nice bright X-ray source, which we uh, managed to detect um, looking off the limb of, of the asteroid. Um, a lot of people have, have called this a photobomb. Um, and this is just a quick video to show the progression over uh, some of our uh, observations. So as we go around the orbit of the asteroid, you can see the source popping up in the background there as we sweep over it. Although the animation is a little bit slow on the uh, online, I see. 
Um, and then finally, I'd like to point out that, uh, again, as I, as I stated in the beginning, Rexus is really a, a student instrument. So we've had a large number of students from the proposal uh, when we proposed the instrument back in 2010, who have worked on different aspects of this in the engineering and the science side in order to actually make this happen. So we've, we've had almost 100 different students who have gone on to, um, uh, to different careers in different, uh, in many, many different fields. Um, and this is just a, a nice uh, bar chart where we've put together the, um, the cumulative time uh, that the student has spent and then where they ended up at the, uh, at the end of, uh, or at least where, where they've ended up at this point in their careers. Um, anyway, uh, with that, I'd like to say that, you know, with, uh, with a, a very, big group, we've managed to put together a small instrument that's been able to produce uh, some interesting science and uh, we're still working on the data. So it'll be interesting to see what else comes of it. Um, and uh, that's it for me. So next is Tim McCoy. All right, take it away, Tim. Thanks, Brandon. So you've heard from my colleagues how excited we are about today's TAG event, collecting a sample of uh, a venue to bring back to Earth. But you're probably wondering, well, what comes next? What do we do with the sample? Well, on September 24th of 2023, the sample return capsule will land at the Utah Test and Training Range. And it'll look something like this. This is uh, the, the Stardust mission that landed about 15 years ago. It's about a meter in size, and we'll go out and collect that sample. But what do we really hope to learn from it? Well, you might be surprised to know that some of the questions we've had for more than 50 years. This is the iconic Earthrise photo taken Christmas Eve of 1968, so eight months before Apollo 11, when Apollo 8 was orbiting the moon, came around from the far side, and captured this image of the Earth rising above the lunar surface. And in that moment, they captured one of the most iconic features of our planet, the pale blue dot, that oceans cover three quarters of the surface of our planet. Now, we all know that oceans are important to our planet, to our country, to our economy, whether it's tourism on the coast of California or the reefs of the Florida Keys, which are really the, the nursery of the oceans, the places where fish are born, to the fisheries of New England, um, all of these are incredibly important places, but you might not be aware that we don't actually know one of the most fundamental questions, which is where did the water for oceans come from? But we have a clue, and that clue is a chemical fingerprint. Uh, just like you have a fingerprint, the ocean has a fingerprint, and that fingerprint is shared by every drop of water in the ocean. It's the ratio of the element hydrogen to its isotope deuterium. Now you might remember isotopes are elements with the same number of protons and electrons, positively and negatively charged particles, but a different number of neutrons, the neutrally charged particles. So deuterium has one neutron compared to hydrogen, which has no neutrons. So what does that tell us? Well, wherever that water came from, it has to have that matching fingerprint, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And there are really two possibilities for that. One of which is it was erupted from volcanoes early in the history of the Earth. So you can imagine the early Earth was a bit of a hellscape, um, boiling hot surface, volcanoes spewing um, molten material out. And with that came gas. And a lot of that gas was probably water, out gas from the center of the planet. The other possibility is it was delivered later in the history of the planet from incoming meteorites or comets, asteroids, that delivered that material to the surface of a since cooled world. And we could decide between these two, if only we could go back in time and get a sample of that material, that pre-Earth material, and decide what it looked like. Well, that's essentially what we're doing. As Vicky talked about, the rocks of, of Bennu are rich in water. They're essentially sponges, not sponges like you find on the ocean floor, but sponges in the sense that they've absorbed somewhere between 10 and 20 weight percent of water. Now that water, you can't just wring it out. You can't grab one of those rocks and wring it out like a sponge. It's trapped within the mineral. So you have to heat that up 
or bombard it with particles to get that water out. But you can actually separate the water, the water that formed before the Earth, the water that captures that early solar system signature, and use that as a clue to where the oceans of our Earth actually came from. Well, where did that water start off life? Well, it actually started off not as water, but as snow. Now, if you've ever climbed a mountain, you've gone above the snow line where the trees stop and snow persists late into the season, sometimes through the entire year. Uh, if you've been in the Rockies, sometimes you have the fun of playing in the snow late in the summer. Well, it might surprise you to know that our solar system had a snow line, that the inner solar system was devoid of, of ice, of snow, but the outer solar system out around Jupiter is where snow, ice came into play. And that's why the outer planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, grew these icy cores and grew these gas shells and became so large. And so water that we have today must have come from that outer solar system. So when we're looking at a rock like Bennu, an asteroid like Bennu, you might just see this, this rock, this barren, devoid of life place. But really what I see is the clue to understanding how oceans formed on our planet, how that life-giving ocean actually started on our own planet. Now, do I see any more than that? That's looking back in the past. What if we look to the future? Well, it's no secret that spacecraft missions are expensive. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission is probably gonna be north of $800 million in cost. And I would point out that every single one of those dollars stays here on our planet, creating jobs for everyone from scientists and engineers that work on the mission today to the people who mined the raw materials that make up our spacecraft. But if there's one part of the mission where we spend a lot in a short amount of time, it's on launch. It's on breaking that bounds of Earth and the, overcoming the gravity to get off our planet. And so I want you to think for a minute, as you think about space mining, don't think about an economy from space, think about an economy in space. So if a penny saved is a penny earned, how do we earn that penny by saving money on launch costs? And the easiest way to do that is to reduce the mass of the payload. Now, when we think about this economy in space, what is the greatest commodity? What is the most expensive thing to get into space? And it might surprise you that the answer is that same drop of water. Now, you might think of water as so common that you, you don't even give it a second thought. You turn on the faucet, water comes out, you pay a few pennies for it. Maybe you buy bottled water, it costs a couple of dollars a bottle. But think about what you can do with water in space. You can make drinkable water, of course. We need water to consume. You can break it down into its component elements, hydrogen and oxygen. You can use that oxygen to make breathable air. You can use the hydrogen as fuel, right? Fuel for energy. And in fact, if you liquefy the oxygen, combine it again with the hydrogen, you can make rocket fuel out of it. So from water, you can actually make rocket fuel. And something you might not even think about, if you wanna go on a long journey in space, so if you wanna use this economy in space to drive us further into space, to allow us to do more, one of the greatest risks to humans in that is cosmic rays, these high energy cosmic rays, even more energetic than what Brandon was talking about with solar x-rays. They're incredibly dangerous to humans. We're shielded from them by our own atmosphere. But if you get outside the earth, you don't have that atmospheric shielding and water is incredibly effective at shielding from cosmic rays. So from that drop of water, you can do all these things. So when you watch the news coverage later today or tomorrow morning and you see this barren looking rock, I want you to think about it not as a barren rock, but as a rest stop in that economy and space, a rest stop where we can get that water, that most essential commodity to ultimately drive from that footprint on Apollo back in 1969 to the footprint on Mars that we will someday put on the surface of the red planet. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you to all of our speakers. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll go ahead and get those answered for you.
Well, I have a question uh, while we're waiting for other folks to type. Um, so I heard something about on November 2nd, there is something headed towards us. Is that something that we should worry about? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I, can, I can answer that. Um, so the short answer is no, you don't need to worry about it. Um, this, this asteroid got some headlines because of the fact that it is supposed to hit us the day before the election. It's not a great time. It's 2020, et cetera. Um, but the asteroid itself is about as large as a Volkswagen bug. So it's not, it's not like Bennu size that could actually do some serious damage. It's very small itself. The chances of it actually hitting Earth are, I think, less than 1%, maybe even less than half of 1%. So it probably won't hit us. Um, and even if it did, it's so small that it, chances are it would burn up in the atmosphere before it got anywhere close to hitting the Earth. And even if it did hit Earth, it would be so small that it wouldn't really do much damage. So good headline, but the, the risks are close to zero. Good, good. I mean, in 2020, we, we always need to check these things. Exactly. Um, so any other questions? Because I have, I have some. No one else has any. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, in figuring out where Earth's water came from, why would we expect water from asteroids to have different deuterium to hydrogen ratios than water squeezed, squeezed out of the Earth's core? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, and, and the answer comes down to the fact that yes, the asteroids that, that came in later to the Earth may not have differed much from the asteroids that made it, that accreted to form the Earth itself. But they might as well. We, you might think of meteorites as just this like generic, there's a meteorite. But in fact, we know of more than 100 different kinds of meteorites, each of which can have its own deuterium to hydrogen ratio, depending in large part on how far out from the sun it formed. And so when we're looking at that fingerprint, that deuterium to hydrogen, as, as scientists, we're really interested in it, not just did it come from a meteorite, exactly what kind of meteorite did it come from? One that formed in relatively close to the sun that would have been low in, in, uh, in deuterium to hydrogen. And think about it, you know, we think that the oceans are vast. They cover three quarters of the surface, but in comparison to the volume of the whole planet, they're really minuscule. So even a tiny amount of water squeezed out from the center of the planet by volcanism could have covered the surface of the planet to the depths of the ocean. So we're really looking specifically at that, uh, at that fingerprint and where it came from. Great. Um, and another question has come in. How long does it take to orbit Bennu? What is the gravitational attraction of the asteroid? Well, I can answer the orbit question. It's about, um, say, for for the for the spacecraft in our orbital observations is about 27, 20, I'm sorry, 24 days. Um, for the uh, gravitational attraction, I actually have to look up the mass and punch in some numbers. But the um, but it's actually an interesting environment. The um, the radiation pressure is is dominant over the gravity in some sense. Um, so. That's, a, that's a, a very challenging environment for the navigation people. Um, actually, in some sense, I'm happy I'm not in their shoes for it. <laughs> I, I think I looked this up recently and it was something like one ten thousandth the gravitational attraction of Earth. So to put that in perspective, if you were standing on the surface of Bennu on the equator and jumped, you probably wouldn't come back. And uh, amazingly low gravity, which is one of the reasons we're not landing because there's no gravity to really stick to the asteroid. You know, we've been, I've been working on this mission for 15 years. I think I'm the longest of anyone that's on this call working on this mission. And we're gonna touch the surface for something like five seconds. So think about that, a 15 year journey we've been on writing proposals and getting selected and building a spacecraft and launching, traveling through space, orbiting the asteroid, learning all this stuff and we get five seconds to touch the asteroid. And that hopefully will be enough. That's great. Are there, are there other questions? 
So since there are so few sandy spots to collect samples from, do you expect the sample to be a good representative of the rest of Bennu, or might there be differences in the composition at that point? So I can touch on this one a little bit. Um, the data that we've collected, we've been fortunate that we need, we've been able to use our spectrometers all over the surface of Bennu to characterize it. And this, the locations of the tag sites that we had selected don't appear to show significant compositional differences from the rest of Bennu. So if Bennu had areas that were clearly composed of one of two different things and we could only go to one of those spots, we would be more worried that we wouldn't get a completely representative sample. But Bennu appears to be homogenized, and part of that may be uh, due to what Erica was talking about, about Bennu being a rubble pile. Um, it's kind of undergone a, a lot of, of churn over, over the eons. And so it so far seems like the sample is likely to be fairly representative, which will be great. Great. Thanks. Um, other questions? Well, I have a question. Um, having worked on, on space uh, 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 missions myself, kind of what is your one takeaway or what would you want someone to know about all those years? Like Tim said, you know, worked on something for 15 years and you get five seconds. So what, what's kind of your thoughts today um, as you finally get to, to see the sample taken today? Well, I, I sent an email. I'm the chair of the department at the Mineral Science at the Smithsonian. So I sent a, a um, an email to my department with a sort of general, I try to send general career advice. And, and the advice I sent was no risk, no reward. If you're not willing to commit the time, if you're not willing to take the risk, I mean, these are risky missions that we, we fly, then you'll never get the reward. You'll never really find out the answers to these questions that we can only answer by doing this sort of exploration. And so when you're looking at this, think, yeah, something could go wrong. We don't think it will. We've practiced, we're a great team. We think we're ready, but without the risk, there can't be the reward. I think for me, it's, uh, there's a, a Carl Sagan quote that I, I like to think about where, I'll paraphrase, he says something out, somewhere out there, there's something waiting to be known. And that's why I do this work. Um, it's worth the hard work, it's worth the meetings, it's worth you know, the waiting, it's worth the, the, the fear and all of the excitement because at the end of it, there's something that we, we will learn and we've learned many things already. Um, but yeah, to me, it's, it's just that quest for, for learning new things. For me, I think that this mission has shown us not to not to be tacky about it, but expect the unexpected is kind of the way that you should approach planetary exploration. Um, and I'm still an early career scientist, so this is the first active space mission that I've worked on. But my expectations about what we would find at Bennu going in were completely different from what we actually saw when we got to Bennu. And I think the same can be said of most of the scientists on the team, like Vicky said, that we we identified these particle ejection events that we were not expecting, but because the spacecraft was designed so well, we were lucky enough to detect them and be and we were able to do science that we never thought we'd be able to do at a scale we didn't think we'd be able to attain because we were able to make a few observations at the right time. Um, and that's really the theme of of everything that's been able to happen in planetary exploration from the Apollo era through literally today with this mission that you, you go for one reason, but you realize you can do something completely different. And that's why I enjoy this job. And uh, yeah, if, I'm, if I might add, although I think uh, everybody really answered the question very well, I, I think that um, you know, part, of the, part of the reward in some sense is, is that the more we know about our world, the more we know about things, um, the better prepared we are to deal with future issues, future problems. Not to mention, you know, that, you know, as you can see, even, even for an asteroid that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we thought we had it very well locked down, but you, you get there and you see it's, it's very different than you expect. It's not sandy. It's, it's very, very rocky on, on such a macroscopic scale. And that really illustrates that there are so many things that we don't know about the, the, the world and the universe. So for science in general, 
I see it as a, as a pursuit of, um, what should I say, trying to find all of the, the blank spots and, um, and really, really trying to, uh, to get a beat on, on all sorts of questions. And there are so many questions. It's, it's an incredibly rewarding, um, but very time consuming process. Definitely. Being curious is, is very important in this line of work. Um, are there any last questions? Um, so for the recent uh, discovery, discovered ejections of the one to 10 centimeter particles, if thermal fractures are the cause, why wouldn't Bennu have exhausted its water supplies over the billions of years it's been floating through the solar system? Is the amount of water used for this so little that it can persist over those billions of years or does it recapture the water somehow afterwards? Oh, and another great question. When we talk about thermal fracturing, I want you to think about um, the energy that, that goes into these. I mean, we see these one to 10 centimeter particles. I think they calculated the energy as the amount of energy to launch all of these rocks at one point is about the same amount of energy you would use to snap a saltine cracker in half. And so because the gravity is so low, it's a tremendously small amount of energy and it may not be driven by water at all. It may just be driven by the thermal expansion and contraction of the rock. But remember that water isn't sitting there as ice or as, as liquid water. It's bound in those minerals. Those minerals really want to hold on to that. So they might expand and contract based on their structure, but that doesn't mean they're going to lose their water. And so even after billions of years, four and a half billion years, these rocks still have their water in them. And, and Vicki has shown that quite nicely with the spectrometer work that she's done. Thanks, Tim. Vicki, did, did you want to comment or you're all set? No, I think Tim explained Tim it perfectly. Knew. Awesome. Great. Well, we are just about at the hour, so I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you all so much for your engagement and excitement in this series. If you have any suggestions for other topics or questions on any of the astronomy topics presented here, please feel free to reach out to Greg Abbott at the Smithsonian, uh, Kelsey Crafton or Joel Perret at the American Astronomical Society or myself, and we'll help you get that information that you need. So please stay tuned for the, uh, for the announcements of the Space on the Hill for next month, where we, where we will be focusing on Venus. Um, and that search for uh, the, the report of uh, life. So thank you all again for attending and we'll see you next month.